Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. All participants are muted. Our text for today actually is the same one that we had last week, at, and, and uh, Gene read it in our scripture. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Like newborn babes crave spirit, pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. As we said last week, a Christian life starts with a spiritual birth experience. You can't begin a spiritual life merely by making some good resolutions. We listed some of those last week. But you can't begin a spiritual life merely by making some good resolutions or joining a congregation of believers or joining a church. Spiritual salvation is much more than the developing an excellence of character or being a member of a church. Now, until you experience a birth from above, until you experience a birth uh, initiated by the Holy Spirit, you are in spiritual death. You do not have the life of God in you. You don't have that until you're born of the Spirit. Now, until you're born of the Spirit, you're kind of like an unfertilized egg that has the potential of growth. So it's like an unfertilized egg with the potential for spiritual growth. And God uses his divine word to fertilize that spiritual egg and bring you into his family. Now, some people refuse to receive God's word in faith. Consequently, they deprive themselves of this spiritual birth. So you got to be born first before you can begin to grow. Last week, we talked about the necessity of spiritual growth. Now today, I want to talk about some of the hindrances and obstacles that we have to overcome in order for us to grow spiritually. Because we need to recognize some of the things that could block our pathway to spiritual maturity. The first thing is that we have to we have to uh, recognize is that we have a fallen human nature that makes spiritual growth difficult. Now, have you ever known someone who had a congenital defect that prevented him or her from going to maturity? And now, you know, most most of us have been acquainted with at least one child who had a birth defect that prevented growth to normal maturity. In a real sense, all of us have a spiritual defect that discourages, that, that discourages us from being who God wants us to be. I'll tell you what that is. It's with our sinful, sinful nature. We have a sinful human nature that makes spiritual growth difficult. Now, as I said many times, what God wants us to be is to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. God wants us to be like Jesus, but, as I said before, we have a spiritual defect that must be overcome. We're all sinners. Now, when I say sinners, by the term sinners, I'm describing a condition of our being rather than just describing conduct. I'm describing a condition, not just conduct. Romans 5.12 says this. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and this and in this way came, I'm sorry, and in this way death came to all people because all Sin. Sin entered the world through Adam, and because we're the sins of Adam, we have that nature. Each of us has within our innermost being a fatal flaw. Because we are sinners, we find it easier to choose a path of rebellion than to the path of obedience. Our natural tendency is toward rebellion. Now, Paul describes it this way. 
Paul, here's the way Paul describes that, and, and I want us to look at that. It's in Romans chapter 7. It's a long passage, 7 through 20, but I'll read it quickly, but I think you'll get my point, that we've got a fatal flaw which hinders us in our spiritual growth. Romans 7, 7 through 20. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have not known what coveting was if the law had not said you should not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, soul as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what, and this is, this, is, this is the part I want to really understand. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So we have to somehow overcome this fatal flaw that we have in order to grow the, to spiritual maturity. So what's the answer to overcoming this obstacle? It's also in Romans chapter 7, verse 25. So here's the answer to overcoming this obstacle of our sin nature. Romans 7, 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my, but in my sinful nature uh, a slave to the law of sin. So the answer to this hindrance, uh, this answer to this fatal flaw that we have of our sinful nature is Jesus Christ. Now if we fail to recognize the presence of our sinful nature, we may have an overly idealistic concept of ourselves. This oversight can contribute to a neglect, a life that does not, not, does not reach its spiritual maturity because we, we then have an over-idealistic concept of self because we fail to realize that we have a fatal flaw that was overcome by Jesus Christ. Here's a warning that Paul gives us in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to you. So let's recognize that we have a fatal flaw in our and our uh, a growth towards spiritual maturity, and the answer to that flaw that we have, when we have to admit that, is Jesus Christ. Also, poor listening habits prevent spiritual growth. Now, Jesus told a parable once to 
illustrate the importance of listening. Remember, poor listening habits prevent spiritual growth. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, Jesus told a parable to illustrate the importance of listening. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got in a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow a seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever he has ears, let them hear. Now in this parable, Jesus illustrated how the farmer sows his seed on various kinds of soil. The condition of the soil in which the seed is sown largely determines the end product. So when Jesus closed this parable, the command was whoever has ears, let them hear. Now Jesus later explained the parable and described how different people hear and respond to the word of God. It continues in, in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 18. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears a message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears a word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. What Jesus was saying in this parable was that, that only the person who really hears and responds will have an abundant, abundant harvest and grow and mature spiritually. So let's examine ourselves. Let's examine ourselves. Are you a wayside hearer of God's word like the seed that fell along the path? Well, here's what happens. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the words came and ate it up. Do you refuse to let God's word penetrate your heart and produce the desired results? So think about that. Are you a wayside hearer of God's word? Are you a rocky ground hearer? The, 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 the seed that fell on rocky ground, that's it, uh, verses 5 and 6 of Matthew 13. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. So the question is, do you permit God's word to enter your heart only in a superficial way? We come to church, we hear the word, we hear it, sounds good, we go on our way. Uh, we, 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 we get up every morning and we have a Bible reading, but we don't really study. We read it because it's a habit and we go our way. It's a superficial thing. So we may fall into the category of being a rocky ground hero. Do you, the next question is, do you let the cares of the world choke out the word of God? That chapter, verse 7 of chapter 13 said, Other seed fell on more thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Now, does what's happening during COVID-19 and the restrictions associated with, with it cause us to retreat 
into our personal shells and become more fruitful? Do we forget the commandments that we should love everybody, even our enemies? Are we frustrated because of what's happening today with racial injustice and differing political ideologies to the point that our witness is affected? Does our desire to make our personal point cause us to be unfruitful? If we Think about that. Do we let the cares of this world, what's going on, choke out the word of God? Because in the, word, in the word of God are the answers and the peace that we need during these times. Or, do you hear, like the, the seed that fell on good ground, do you hear and respond to God's word like the seed planted in good soil? And in verse 8 of chapter 13, it says, Still other seed fell on good, on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So do we let the word germinate and grow in us and produce a harvest? How you hear and respond to God's word and truth will determine the extent of your spiritual growth. Another hindrance or an obstacle is the world, the world system or society and it's and all of our material resources, everything around us, the material stuff, all the stuff around us, that can be an impediment to our spiritual growth. Um, you know, and, and all those things are temporary, but they can be an impediment to our spiritual growth. Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, we shouldn't really be concerned about the temporary things. We shouldn't be concerned about that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians writes this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix our so we fix our eyes on what is seen. Not, but I'm sorry. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, Apostle John makes it even more plain in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Here's what he writes. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now John warned us about caring too much for the things of human existence, things that would not last. Now what he warned us against, he said, do not love the world or anything in the world. He was referring to society because it ignores, society ignores God and rebels against him. Now, when, God, when, when, when John wrote this, when John said, do not love the world or anything in the world, he was pointing out the, the perishable things, things that will fade away, the perishable nature of the material things that the unbelieving world considers to be of value. He was urging believers, he urged us to think about and live about and live with our eye toward things that last forever. Don't worry about the perishable things, but eternal things because worrying about those things can be an impediment to our spiritual growth. Now, I also, and this is interesting as I was studying for this sermon, it's interesting that our human tendency to procrastinate hinders our spiritual growth. I want to repeat that 
our human tendency to procrastinate hinders our spiritual growth. Now, I talked a couple of times, including uh, last week, about our need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, here's what I said last week. Uh, and I, I pointed to the scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. As hunger and thirst are the most highly developed of our natural appetites, the hunger and thirst for righteousness is the kind of hunger and thirst that we need. Just as physical craving is urgent and calls for instant gratification. Remember I said this last week. Just as physical craving is urgent and calls for instant gratification, there's a spiritual craving that is equally, if not, if not more important, if not more important for us to crave spiritual things. We are not to hunger and thirst after happiness. Remember that. But we are to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when Jesus said that, he was actually asking, how much do you want righteousness? The question is, do we want righteousness as much as a hungry person wants food? If we do, then Jesus says that we'll be blessed or we'll be happy. So be careful and, and remember that our human tendency to procrastinate hinders, hinders growth. We need to hunger and thirst and chase after righteousness. Then, of course, finally, of course, Satan is an obstacle to our spiritual growth. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Peter warns us that Satan is an obstacle to our spiritual growth. 1 Peter 5.89 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Satan is an obstacle to our spiritual growth. Recognize it. Those who ignore or joke about the devil are deceiving themselves and depriving themselves of the resources that God has made available for living a victorious Christian life. Because Satan would like to see it to it that we remain in spiritual infancy, that we remain immature in spiritual matters. Now, each one of us, is responsible. Each one of us is responsible for overcoming these obstacles to spiritual growth because we will remain in spiritual infancy if we neglect the means of spiritual growth and postpone responding to the, to the opportunities for growth that are actually provided by the church. A few weeks ago, uh, I said in a sermon that a great way to stimulate spiritual growth is to be is to is to be is to be present or to or to uh, uh, a great way of overcoming the obstacles of spiritual growth is by the church. The reason I keep hesitating, uh, I've got a, having a problem with my phone, so I apologize for that. The church provides a great opportunity for us to grow spiritually. I said in a sermon uh, a few weeks ago that, that I realized that during COVID-19, our involvement with the church may be different, but we still do need that involvement, whether it's, the, whether it's like we're here today on the phone or whether it's social media or it's just outdoors in a parking lot, we need to take advantage today of the, 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 the opportunities for spiritual growth provided by the church. Because, if we remember, if it hadn't been for the church, we would not know about God's love and this great salvation offered through Jesus Christ. Jesus wants the church to, 
to be communicators of God's wonderful works revealed through Christ and experienced in our own lives. Uh, Jesus said this about the believers and that the church, we as believers are the church. Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are a light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And also, I mentioned that we the church are, an, are am, to be ambassadors for Christ. The scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.20 says that we ambassadors, are ambassadors of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20. We are, Christ, we are Christ's ambassadors as, through, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So, let me go back over these hindrances that we've got to understand are there so that we can deal with them as we go on in our spiritual growth. One, we have to realize that we have a fallen human nature that makes spiritual growth difficult. The answer to that is salvation through Jesus Christ. We have poor listening habits that prevent spiritual growth. So we've got to concentrate and let God's word germinate in our hearts so that we can grow spiritually. But remember that this world and its resources, all the material things of this world around us can be an impediment to spiritual growth if we're focusing on those things and not eternal things. Our human tendency to procrastinate hinders our spiritual growth. And finally, Satan is an obstacle to our spiritual growth. So we realize those things and we take advantage now of the, the opportunities for growth that come through the church. We must be constantly alert so that others' faults and mistakes will not cause us to stumble on our way to spiritual maturity. Now, we can't be held responsible for the actions of others, but we're we are responsible to God for our growth. We are responsible. We are responsible to God for our spiritual growth. No one can do your eating for you. No one can do your sleeping for you. No, and no one can do your learning for you. And no one can do your growing for you. So each one of us has to determine that with the Holy Spirit's help, we will nourish ourselves from God's word. We will avoid anything that could prevent us from becoming the competent, mature persons that God wants us to be so that we can fully experience our great salvation today. We do have a great salvation. And in this series, we've talked about the fact of salvation in the past. That's when, we, uh, when, when we're born again. Uh, we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior and are saved. That's salvation in the past. We've talked about salvation in the future, which will be when Christ returns or that we're with him and that we're free from even the presence of sin. But we're not in the past and we're not in the future. We're in the present. So we, uh, we need to be able to enjoy and experience our salvation in the present. And in order to do that, we must grow and mature spiritually and that's our responsibility remember uh, no one can do our eating for us we have to eat it do ourselves no one can do our sleeping for us we have to sleep ourselves no one can do our learning for us we have to do ourselves 
and no one can do a growing or maturing for us, we have to do our, that ourselves. So again, let's determine that with the Holy Spirit's help, we will nourish ourselves from God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together today by phone. We thank you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit guides and, and causes us to overcome any technical issues that we have. We thank you, Father, for that because we know that your word has overcome all of these things. That was an obstacle to us today, but your word is, is more powerful than anything that can be a hindrance. So we thank you for that, Father. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we honor you, we glorify you. We look forward to being together again, either, either virtually or in person. But we know, Father, that we are with you when we are together. We praise you and honor you and glorify you. And thank you, Lord God, for this great salvation and your word which causes us, gives us the tools that we need to experience it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all